It's Dr. Dickinson, and I want to talk to you today about the CalTPA video requirements. And in fact, if you stay tuned on the video, you're going to actually get to see a video of me working with a group of second graders. So before we do that, let's just talk about some of the expectations. If you're starting on CalTPA Cycle 1, then you're going to be required to submit three video clips. Now, these three video clips obviously are gonna be from your lesson plan that you're designing. And the requirement from CalTPA is that each of these video clips are at a maximum of five minutes. So certainly you can submit a little bit less than five minutes, but again, I would always advise to showcase your teaching as much as you can, and that will help you in terms of writing some really good annotations, which is also an important part of your video clips. So now that we talked about three video clips, five minutes each, what are they looking for in each video clip? Well, your first video clip is the opening of the lesson. And in this video clip, it's really important that you speak clearly and you set clear expectations, um, whether that is about what you're going to be learning about or how your new lesson um, builds on prior knowledge, so activating some of that prior knowledge, the students have a clear expectation of what they're going to be doing in the lesson that day. So essentially, you're framing the lesson. You're framing it for the viewer, and you're framing it for your students, and maybe you have an agenda posted on the board, or maybe you have a slide deck, or maybe you're just talking about it. Those are all acceptable, and they're all great things. So once we have done that, we want to make sure that we're also in video clip number one, setting a positive learning environment. Now, this is really going to depend in terms of what a positive environment is. It's going to depend on the grade level that you're teaching. So for example, in my video clip, I'm working with second graders. And so part of that positive environment, since they're going to be getting their lesson on the carpet, is reviewing some of the expectations for when we're sitting on the carpet because it's really hard for kiddos to sit on the carpet. But maybe you're working with middle schooler or high schoolers and that positive environment might be asking them about their weekend or greeting them at the door or doing something that's non-curricular that helps create a space where students feel safe and they feel, you know, like they can participate and you care about them. So again, video clip number one, we're setting clear expectations, we're greeting our students, or setting a positive um, tone in our classroom, and we can, again, include some non-curricular activities really briefly because we want to get to our lesson. And that brings us to our second video clip. Now, in our second video clip, what is critical in this video is how you are actively engaging your students. What that means is that you are fostering a student-centered instruction in your classroom. So think about what student-centered means. It means students are working with a peer, maybe they're doing a turn and talk, or maybe they're working in a small group. They could even be at the board problem solving. Or they could be working with a partner doing an activity where they're talking about their rough draft and what they'd like to improve. The key piece here is the reviewers really want to see the students engaged and they want them to be actively involved in the lesson. So the last thing they want to see is you just up there talking the whole time and giving them the answers or telling them what they should know. Um, you could be asking some higher order thinking questions and there could be a discussion, right? Or you could be in a science classroom or even math and you could be doing an inquiry approach to instruction where students are discovering a phenomenon or they're discovering the algorithm. Um, students could also be using technology. They could be creating products of learning. I've had students create digital projects, or maybe they're in an English language arts class and they're creating a meme based on the theme of a story. The key piece here is students are doing the work. Students are doing the lifting and the viewer is really seeing your students engaged. All right, we're on to video clip three. You can do this. 
Finally, in this third video clip, you want to make sure that you're summarizing some of the key things that you learned about. So you'll see this in my video, I'm summarizing, we're talking about an array and then we're summarizing what we learned and what we discovered in this inquiry approach to um, not just creating array, looking at arrays, identifying arrays, but also writing it symbolically. So we're summarizing it, we're thinking about that progression of learning and what we learned. And then we're gonna check for understanding. Now, check for understanding could be a Q&A. It can also be an assessment, an exit ticket, a quick write. But the key piece here is it's very, again, student-centered, discussion-oriented, ask and answer questions. And finally, in video th clip three, you want to kind of cement that and talk about how it builds on what you're going to be doing next or what your students are going to be learning about in a subsequent lesson. So you want to build that progression for your students as well as the viewer. So I hope you found this video helpful. Again, three video clips, maximum of five minutes each. Clip number one, you're opening, you're setting that expectation, you're creating a safe, pause environment. Video clip two, active engagement, student-centered. Video clip three, whole group discussion or small group discussion summarizing those key learning goals that you worked on, checking for understanding, and then wrapping up and talking about what's happening next. All right, well, thank you so much, educators. And again, you can do this. Hard things are part of the process, and I believe in you. See you next time. Forward, yes. Okay, put your hands to yourself. Okay, so where should your hands be? In your mouth. In your mouth. In your lap, and if you have a hard time, oops. and if you have a hard time with your hands sitting still, you can just do this. Okay, just try to focus. You can do a little um, war with your fingers. Yes. Um, listen to the teacher when she's speaking, and don't like, don't like mess around. Like, don't look down when the teacher. Right. So when you listen. It's really important to make eye contact. So can everyone show me their eyes? And so that helps me check in to make sure that you're all listening and you understand. All right, so we did a really good job going over the rules. We know we have to sit with our feet crisscross applesauce, not talk to our partner, raise our hand, not blur it out, and make eye contact so that we're listening. Beautiful. You guys are ready to learn. Awesome. My name is... Patricia, you guys can call me Dr. D, Dr. Dickinson. My students call me Dr. D. Today we're going to build on some of the things that we've already been learning about with counting collections. Okay? Who remembers what we were working on last week with our collections? What were we making? Yes? We were making arrays. An array. Okay, turn to your partner and tell your partner what you think an array is. Conversations. Well, can you can you share what you said to me about what an array is? Um, it's groups of, of like big ten, seven. And you have so you have multiplication and you have groups. Can someone else add on to that? What else do we know about an array? Good job. Yes. Okay, so you have multiplication to organize your thinking. Yeah. Can you give me an example? Like if I had 10 times 10 and I did not use like 10, and if I um, had still actors, uh -huh. I could use, <clears throat> and I could use like another 10 times 10 if I have like another 10 times 10. Like I would have <laughs> Oh.
Okay, so you, you're using multiplication in groups of things to help organize. Can we see um, what what does an array look like? How can I help? How what can help me think about what an array looks like so I can find them? Emmett. Uh, so say that you're going to do a ten by ten. Okay. You do ten down, okay. ten across, and then you do. Is that right? No. Ten down, ten across. No. No. Well, kind of, yeah, but not really. No. So we do. Dot. Are you thinking what? dots? Are we thinking uh, dots? Kinda. Oh, so you're using an object. Yeah. Is that what you're saying? To make ten mm -hmm. rows of ten. Yeah. And then you go like that, and then ten across, and then. And then ten across. Two. Yeah. And then you just have to fill that in by going down. Yeah. And right, and so this then becomes our counting collection, right? Yeah. Using objects, we can make a collection of objects to represent a multiplication sentence or a product. What would be the product of 10 groups of 10? Everyone. Because we know that 10 times 10 is 100. So today what we're going to do is we're going to do a fun scavenger hunt. Because I think we might be able to see arrays not just when we're making them with collections, but in the real world. When we see objects and groups of objects together that can build an array. So an array has what kind of shape, everyone? Is it a circle? No. Is it a triangle? No. Is it a polygon? No. What shape is it? A square. A square rectangle. Very good. So we're going to look for objects that are shaped like a square or a rectangle. Hey, I got something. A square. Tonight, when you go home, 
for your homework. Okay, I want you to make a connection. When, well, I want you to make a connection tonight. I want to see if you can find some arrays just like I did at your house. 